The book of James, chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. James is not the Apostle James, found in the Gospels. Actually, the James who wrote this epistle was the, was the half-brother of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we ask that you would sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. He begins in verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Tells you a little bit of, about James right there. He was not a name dropper. He could have referred to himself as the brother or the half-brother of Christ, of Jesus, the Lord, but he didn't. He simply referred to himself as a servant of Jesus and a servant of God. To the twelve tribes which are scattered abroad, greetings. Well, this letter was originally sent to Christian Jews. Back in Old Testament days, the Israelites were scattered out of their land by their enemies as punishment from God. And the scattered Jews mentioned here in verse 1 were some of those Israelites who never returned. The message of Jesus reached them where they were, and they became Christians. Two, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. In other words, God says, when you go through hard times, and he's talking to Christians, when you go through hard times, look beyond the hard times. There's nothing good about bad. But God can bring good out of bad. There's nothing fun about problems. However, we can trust that God allows bad to bring about good. That's a real test of faith. I know that. And only those with faith in God and faith in his word will respond to bad times with trust. With faith in Christ, with faith in Christ, our focus will not be on the circumstances, but rather on the God of the circumstances. Verse 3, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. If a person will draw closer to Jesus Christ during trials, then from the time the trial begins, they will notice a change in themselves. They will notice a spiritual improvement. As we trust in Christ, through hard times, as we endure trials by believing that God has allowed them for a reason, our faith will grow stronger, and faith develops perseverance. There's no easy way to develop perseverance. There's no easy way to grow stronger spiritually. In this fallen world, Results, both physical and spiritual results, come only through struggle. People who never had to struggle are weak and shallow people. Verse 4, But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. God has never promised any Christian an easy life. There are good times and there are bad times, but godliness does not guarantee a life of ease, a life free of pain or trouble. In fact, according to what God says right here, suffering, pain, and trouble are an important part of our spiritual growth process. Difficulties are not fun, but they are not the enemy. They hurt, but they do not harm. And so as Jesus embraced the cross, which hurt him, but helped us, so we, by faith, can embrace our trials, which hurt, but work to sanctify us. 
5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. God wants to give us wisdom even more than we want wisdom. God wants us to know what is right, and he wants us to do what is right. The problem is, sometimes people want to go with their feelings or their desires, and so they either do not search for God's wisdom on a subject, or they reject it when they learn it. Again, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. God says, ask in faith. Meaning this, when we pray, we are to believe that God will say yes, if it is according to his will, and if it doesn't contradict his word, and if the time is right. In other words, faith in prayer and faith in general involves trusting in the good sense of God. Seven. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. If we do not pray believing that God will hear and answer in the correct way, then our prayers are nothing but a big waste of time. Totally useless. If that's the way a person prays, then their mind isn't even in it. Their prayers are vain jangling. 9. Let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation. Christians are forgiven sinners, and that is it. According to Jesus, even faithful Christians who have done everything expected of them are unworthy servants. In light of that, our self-respect and our self-worth doesn't come from who we are. It comes from who we are in Christ. Consequently, if I'm not good-looking or smart or wealthy, that's not the end of the world. Because I don't find my identity in those things. It's not the end of the world. Do you know what it is? It's nothing. It's absolutely nothing. And I say that because no matter what I have going for me, or I don't have going for me, I can rejoice that I'm in the family of God. And I can have fun with Jesus anytime I want to. And someday I'll be in a brand new raised body and I will live on the new earth forever. And those are pretty good things. And so he says, let the lowly brother glory in his exaltation. But the rich in his humiliation, because as a flower of the field, he will pass away. There are no big shots in the church. Only sinners saved by God's grace through the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. A Christian who is a billionaire is no better than a Christian who is an unemployed pulper. It's a fact. I'm not saying I wouldn't want to be a billionaire. Well, I'd buy all sorts of radio time and television time if, if I was a billionaire. And I suppose good looks, wealth, and position are, are a nice thing to have. But they're nothing to get too excited about because they're not going to last. God compares them to wildflowers. If you know anything about wildflowers, you know they start blooming in the spring, but before long they're gone. Just like apple blossoms and lilacs. Wonderful. For the couple of weeks that they're here, they come and go very quickly. And good looks and position and wealth will not last very long either. Knowing Jesus is the only thing that really matters. 11. For no sooner has the sun risen with a burning heat than it withers the grass, its flowers falls, its flower falls, 
and its beautiful appearance perishes, so the rich man also will fade away in his pursuits. If you go outside and you look at the grass during a dry spell, it is very easy to see which part doesn't get shade. The portion of grass which the sun shines on all day is dry, brown, and brittle. And when you walk on it, it crunches. And God says that's the destiny of the wealth of the wealthy. Wealth, influence, and looks are just as fleeting as, as grass in the hot sun. We need to find our identity in Jesus and in our relationship to him instead of in these other things which so quickly fade. Twelve, blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been proved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. The crown of life refers to eternal life. That's all it's talking about. It's talking about salvation. Like the Bible teaches in so many pl many places, he who endures to the end will be saved. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been proved, he will receive the crown of life. He who endures to the end will be saved, the Bible says over and over again. People who quit on Jesus are not the elect. They are not the saved. I got, a, I got an email from somebody in Tasmania, Australia, believe it or not. Boy, did they take issue with me over this. They said, you can quit on Jesus and you are still saved. I wrote back and I said, my friend, you have to do a lot of scripture twisting to get to that position. It simply isn't true. People who continue with Christ through trouble, if need be, are the ones who receive eternal life, according to verse 12. Verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. In other words, God is saying, don't blame me for your sin. Some people blame God. God made me this way. Don't blame me for your sin, says God. Blame shifting comes real natural to us because of our sinful nature. Adam blamed Eve for his sin in the garden. Actually, Adam blamed God. He said, that woman that you gave me, God, she gave me the fruit. Why did you give me that woman? You know, it's kind of your fault that I sinned, God. That was the implication. And so Adam blamed Eve and God, and then Eve blamed the serpent. They both could have just saved their breath because their sin was their fault, just as our sin is our fault. That's the way God sees it because that's the way it is. Again, 13 and then 14. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. It's really very simple. People sin because they are sinners. People sin because they want to sin. No one holds a gun to their head and forces them to sin. In fact, sin, by definition, involves making the wrong choice. It's a choice. Sin is choosing of one's own volition to do the wrong thing. Whether it is blatant sin, like lying, or something more subtle, like bitterness or pride, people do it because at that moment, they choose to do it. 15. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Sinful desire leads to sin. And sin leads to death. Sin does lousy things. Sin ruins individuals 
and families and nations. Sin leads to sickness and sorrow and physical and spiritual death. Ultimately, if not repented of and forgiven through Jesus Christ, sin leads to eternal hell. Sin is no good and only leads to what is no good. And yet man still craves it. Think about that. Sin is no good and only leads to what is no good, and yet man still craves it? No wonder man cannot save himself but needs the grace of God. How sick is that? How disgusting is that? 16. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Man not only sins, but he often makes up excuses for sins and justifies it as well. But don't be deceived. The Bible says the heart of man is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And by that, God is saying, don't be deceived and don't be self-deceived. When you tell yourself you've got a right to commit this sin, so go ahead, you are lying to yourself. You are deceiving yourself. When you or someone else says, hey, a little bit of sin doesn't hurt, that's a deception. Don't be deceived. A little bit of sin does hurt. Sin is like arsenic. A little bit at a time will add up and eventually push one over the edge until their life is ruined and they're burning in hell. Verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. God only gives us good things. The problem is, people take God's good things and abuse them. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from God. God doesn't give God bad things. People make good things bad things. It's not God's fault that sinful man takes something good like food and turns it into the sin of gluttony. It's not God's fault that sinful man takes leisure or sports or entertainment and turns it into a god or takes wine or beer and turns it into the sin of drunkenness. It's not God's fault that man takes sex and turns it into fornication and adultery. God gives good things to enjoy. Man perverts and overindulges and turns them into sin. Man chooses to do these things. They are not God's idea. Verse 18, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. The word of God created everything, including man. The word of God also calls man to repent and have faith in Jesus Christ. We wouldn't know about salvation through Christ if it wasn't for the word of God. No one ever gets saved apart from the word of God, which is one reason the devil hates the word of God. 19. Therefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Be quick to listen. God says, I want you to be quick to listen. In other words, he's saying, listen very carefully. People who talk too much seldom listen enough. People who talk too much seldom listen to what other people are saying. That's why they, they often do not learn. And therefore, their many words are often useless and sometimes harmful. I knew someone several years ago who talked more than anyone that I've ever known in my life. And this person continually made the same mistakes over and over and over again, and she wouldn't listen. And it was sad. It was such a waste. People who listen carefully and think before they speak may speak fewer words, but their words are going to be worth more because they listen. God knows what he's talking about. 
Therefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. Slow to get angry. In other words, little things should not cause us to blow our top. We are too touchy if little things make us angry. Too touchy usually means too much of a self-focus and not enough of a Jesus focus. And if we would think more about Jesus hanging on the cross, suffering and dying for our sins, then we wouldn't be so impatient with the little things that go wrong in our life, or for that matter, the big things that go wrong in our life. 20. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Sinful anger just makes things worse. It has never accomplished anything good. It doesn't solve problems. It makes bad problems worse, and it creates new problems in the process. I've seen it. I've probably been guilty of it. But I know I've seen it. 21. Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. If one does not put away filthiness and wickedness, then they are not receiving with meekness the word of God which is able to save their soul. And remember also that this is written to Christians, which means putting away rebellion and humbling oneself before God must be a continual thing. If a person start to, starts to tolerate sin, then God becomes less and less important until he isn't even an issue anymore. The road to hell is littered with people who have done that. Verse 22, But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. Some people think that they're in good shape with God because they know the Bible. Some people think that they're in good shape with God because they've gone to church and they've heard the Bible. Well, hearing and knowing the Word of God is great, but if that's where it stops, if that's all there is, then those people are deceived, deceived if they think everything is fine. Because you sure can't find that in the Bible. I mean, knowing the Bible is step one. Step two is doing it. And I'm not talking about salvation by works. But the Word of God must be applied. Anyone who thinks that they are fine simply because they know the truth has been lulled to sleep spiritually. You know that there will be people in hell who have good theology? Oh, sure. They were very orthodox in their beliefs, but they never acted on them. Hell will include many people who believe that Jesus died for their sins. The problem is they never repented and made Jesus Christ their Lord and Savior. You mean to tell me that somebody can believe that Jesus died and paid for their sins and still end up in hell? Oh, yes. You can believe the right thing and still go to hell? Oh, sure. Jesus said, the servant who knew his master's will but didn't do it will be punished with many stripes. So what if you believe the truth? If you don't act on it, if you don't receive Christ, for example, what good does it do you? It doesn't do you any good. He continues, 23, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he, wa man he was. When you look in the mirror and you see a dirty face, the best thing to do is to wash it before you get busy and forget. The mirror doesn't do me any good if I don't make any of the corrections that it tells me I need to make. God's word is a spiritual mirror. If we do not repent when it tells us to repent, if we do not make the corrections we see that we should make, if we do not receive Jesus Christ as it tells us to do, then it isn't doing us one bit of good. Knowing it is absolutely meaningless in that case. 25. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it 
and is not forgetful here, not a forgetful here, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Notice, he who looks into the perfect law of liberty. Now, the law that gives freedom, as some translations put it, or the law of liberty is the law of Christ. The law of liberty isn't talking about Christians having the liberty to sin. It's not talking about that. It's talking about the liberty not to sin. The law of Christ includes freedom to look into the Word of God and freedom to correct our feelings through the grace of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. That is the law that Christians are under. 26. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. If a person does many religious things but their mouth is full of insults, slander, gossip, and cursing, then they might as well stay home from church because all their religion means absolutely nothing to God. It's useless. Our religious activity isn't as important to God as what kind of person we are. Verse 27. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Holiness, loving God, and helping others is what God calls good religion. And those things, along with faith in Jesus Christ, of course, are the essence of Christianity. In fact, loving God and helping others is the outworking of our faith in Christ. And it is also the criteria by which one is judged by God to be saved or lost, according to Matthew 25, verses 31 through 45. Thank you for spending this time with me. If you want to study further, you can go to our Scripture Verse by Verse website, which is found at thebibleversebyverse.com. That's thebibleversebyverse.com.